Hello again, everyone. I've re-entered the Amiga scene after a couple of decades, and in the intervening period, all sorts of interesting things have happened in the areas of storage and emulation when it comes to the Amiga. Now, people from all over the world have been incredibly helpful in getting me up to speed, and I can't thank them enough. But I have to say, there were times when I did feel a little bit uh, bamboozled. So what I'm trying to do in this video is to pay all that great advice and information forward to others who are new to the Amiga scene or returning to it. Uh, there's a couple of things I just want to cover before we get started. First of all, this is very much a beginner's video. I'm not attempting to look at every possible edge case and technology that's emerged in the past 20 years, just the main things that I've come across. And secondly, I've put all the information that I've encountered so far in a spreadsheet, and I'll put the link to that in the show notes. So I hope you enjoy the video. Let's get started. Right, first off, we have the venerable floppy disk and hard disk. These are still great options for your Amiga. And if you want that authentic vintage Amiga experience with all those lovely whirs and clicks, you can't beat them. And I still use both formats today. Now, just one note on the floppy disks. Most Amigas expect three and a half inch double-sided double density floppy disks. If you're looking on eBay, high density disks are much more common. And your Amiga can treat these as if they were double density perfectly well, but make sure you cover over that high density indicator hole. As weirdly, some Amiga drives can pick up that they're high density, but can't really do anything with them, uh, which will confuse the machine. Okay, now five innovations have broadened the range of storage and emulation options to the point that we have today. These are the compact flashcard, the ADF disk image file, the GoTech floppy emulator, WHD load, and WinUAE. So let's look at each of them. The first way that you can use a compact flashcard is to buy an adapter to convert your Amiga's hard disk controller, if it's got one, to use a compact flashcard in place of the hard disk. There are even adapters that will present the card slot externally, like to the rear expansion port of an A1200, so that you can chop and change between cards. So that your Amiga can boot from the card as if it were a normal hard disk, you'll need to format it with an Amiga file system and install a boot environment. Now one way of doing this is to use a workbench installation floppy, or you might be able to find an image file online. Write this to the card using WinImage or Bellina Etcher on a PC. Either way, your Amiga will then treat the compact flash card in the same way as any genuine Amiga hard disk, and that includes being able to boot from it, which is why presenting it externally, as I've already mentioned, is sometimes a really good option because you can swap between different boot environments. The other way of using a compact flash card is via a PCM CIA adapter. There's an external one of those on A600s and A1200s. So if you've got one of those, it's a great option. The adapter should come with a setup floppy, which at most, will require you to copy a few files to Workbench. So a quick reboot after that and you're up and running. A compact flash card used via the PCM CIA slot is hot swappable. And also it's typically formatted using some sort of variant of the Microsoft FAT file system. So it's a very convenient way to exchange files between your Amiga and a PC or Mac. Also, if you don't like the way it sticks out of the side, you can even buy an angled adapter for a more streamlined look. The only real drawback of the PCMCIA option is that you can't boot from a compact flashcard in this way. So stick to the options I've already mentioned or one or two others that are coming up. Now, there are a few footnotes when it comes to using a compact flashcard with an Amiga, whichever way you use one. Not all compact flashcards will work. Some Amiga adapters ship with a card included, which is a pretty safe bet, or you can ask around on your favorite Amiga forums. In place of a real compact flashcard, you can also use a secure digital or SD card in a converter, but again, not all of them work. Amiga forums are your best friends here too. Also bear in mind that some older versions of Amiga OS have partition size limits, which can limit the use of larger compact flash and SD cards. You'll find that four gigabytes is a common limit that you might come up against. So check online to see what your version of Amiga OS can handle. And if it's a hassle, upgrade to a newer version if you want. Okay, next up is the ADF. This is a single file disk image. It's often made from a floppy disk containing a game, but you also get ADFs of other things too. You can make ADFs on an Amiga using GoADF or EasyADF, both of which are pretty cheap. There are other Amiga and non-Amiga options too. But how does your Amiga load an ADF, I hear you asking? Well, one way is to use a GoTech, which is a device that emulates a floppy disk drive. 
People often use a GoTek as a replacement for the Amiga's default internal floppy drive, which also means that you can boot from it. Connect it to your Amiga's internal floppy drive interface, plug in a USB stick containing one or more ADFs, choose which ADF you want to boot from, and off you go. A GoTek is completely transparent to the Amiga, with no other drivers or software needed, but make sure that you buy one from a specialist Amiga dealer, as it does need to be flashed with the correct firmware. Also, because it uses the floppy drive interface, it's not as fast as some of the other options we're covering today. Another great way of loading ADFs is with the free WHD load software. Uh, this has been around since 1996, so you may well have come across it before. If your Amiga had a hard drive, you'll probably remember back in the day how annoying it was that you couldn't store most of your games on your hard drive and you ended up uh, having to use the original floppies. WHD load solves this problem by enabling ADFs to be loaded from inside Workbench and you can store the ADFs anywhere your Amiga can read from. WHD load is a great piece of software, but make sure that you read the installation instructions as it's not really a next, next, next type of deal to install it. There's additional software you have to install afterwards and WHD load also needs access to a kickstart ROM image file. There are ways to create these from physical kickstart ROM chips or you can buy the image online. Now, if you want to load a specific game ADF, you'll almost certainly need the corresponding patch from the WHD load website. They're called installs. Finally, bear in mind your favorite game may not be expecting Workbench and WHD load to be there eating up your Amiga's RAM. So be prepared to buy a RAM expansion card before you can get some software running. Okay, the final port of call on this journey is WinUAE, which is an Amiga emulator for Windows. This is an incredibly feature rich piece of software and I'd need to make several videos just to go through everything that it can do. Uh, fortunately, other people have already done that, so go and have a search. For now, I'll just give you the essential facts. WinUAE is free and it's easy to install, although like WHD load, you do need to give it a kickstart ROM image file. It can boot from ADFs, as well as from loads of other sources, such as hard disk image files. If you use WinUAE to run Workbench, you can run WHD load on top of WinUAE and that's a really convenient way to access a library of Amiga games and other software on modern PC hardware. But for my money though, you can't beat the real thing. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the video and as always feel free to leave a comment or you can subscribe too.